as an aquanaut. That was just, just an awesome experience, definitely once in a lifetime to be able to go spend nine days about uh, 60 feet below the, the surface in an underwater habitat. And we would do a, a full end-to-end -end mission scenario, simulating the moon or Mars. That's where we really got to put to the test what is exploration of these planetary bodies going with you know a whole, a whole career in the in the rearview mirror in a lot of senses for me the way that i ended up kind of sitting in this seat was by keeping it in the back of my mind so i became interested in mars at a pretty young age actually um, i'm not sure uh, somewhere around fifth grade so this is this was not a defining time for my life but i remember for some school project you know making a little a book about marty the martian that love kind of carried through in college when I found geology because I learned that there's this thing called planetary geology. And the idea of being able to study the surface of another planet was just the coolest thing to me as somebody who, who loved Mars. Geology training on our home planet covers just one aspect of what it would be like to scientifically explore the moon, lower gravity, Extreme temperatures and a bulky spacesuit make operating tools and collecting rocks a great challenge. NASA scientists and engineers work hard to design and build custom tools that will work well in the extreme environment of the moon's south polar region. Making any sort of hardware that flies in space is a huge team effort. I help to lead a team of people who are building moon tools. And so uh, specifically the tools that are going to take samples of the moon and bring them back to Earth so the scientists can study them for generations to come. At Johnson Space Center, we have what's called the Rock Yard, which is essentially kind of a you know large you know open space where we've imported <laughs> rocks. Um, basically a large a human sized sandbox, it's great. At the Rock Yard, we get astronauts to come out to be test subjects, but we also get engineers and scientists and operators to be test subjects as well so that we can fully understand what it's like to be in that crew perspective. So understanding, you know, what what our priorities are, what types of rocks we're interested in and why, but also to start using the tools that we'll be using to collect those samples. Let's just start with the most simple tool, the geology hammer. You, you all know what a hammer looks like, um, but in the South Pole, it's going to be really cold there. 
And so we need to make sure that we're using a material that doesn't break at very cold temperatures. So we create a test plan that includes putting it through environmental testing. So putting the tools in very hot conditions and very cold conditions and making sure they work. We can't just go to the hardware store and buy a hammer. We have to go make a special one. And then we have testing like ergonomic testing to make sure that it actually works with the astronauts and that it fits their gloved hand when they're in the spacesuit. It's not too exhausting for them. There's all of these little different nuances of being in the spacesuit that are hard to fully appreciate unless you get in there. As anyone who's worn a spacesuit will tell you, it feels like wearing a balloon that's constantly pushing down on you. Spacesuits have to meet many demands. They must be sturdy enough to keep astronauts safe in the low gravity and high radiation environment of the moon, but they also have to be nimble enough to allow astronauts to squeeze, poke, and pound their tools. It's tough to describe, honestly. It's large, it's you know about 300 pounds, I think. You're kind of operating your own personal spacecraft in a lot of ways. You know, the intent is for you to be able to manipulate your arms and legs in a, in a way that you would on the ground. So we have a large pool here um, at the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory here on site. In, in the corner, we now have a moon area. So we've um, imported uh, sand and, and rocks down there, and we've started to do run trying to approximate one-sixth gravity. It's a, kind of a lot of moving pieces, but it's, it's really fun. It's one of the coolest things we get to do. And I'll tell you what, some of my most favorite you know, moments at NASA have been when I see these engineers start to get excited about the science that we're doing and start to you know, learn some of the geology terminology, because that really is what creates an effective team. And so hearing, you know, tools engineer Adam Nave start to say, wow, this looks like a basalt that has lots of vesicles with olivine phenocris in it, just make me incredibly excited because it means that, you know, we're learning to speak each other's languages. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I just like to do weird and unique things. So I've always found those, you know, those odd hobbies like learning to juggle or learning to beatbox or do improv. I was watching TV and I saw the TV show American Ninja Warrior and I was just like, I wanna do that. And so I started to train to be a ninja warrior. That's how I decided that I should be called the Space Ninja. And so I would just share my interest of space. I got selected and got to go out there and compete. So I think we would limit ourselves if we only have one vision of what exploration looks like. Being a part of the NASA team has really showed me what that means and what exploration really looks like on a daily basis. But I do enjoy creative writing, short stories, um, poems sometimes, when I can you know, find